Thank you very much, Eileen. So we move on to our next invited talk by Dr. Kartik Ramani, who's a professor of, uh, in the School of Engineer, Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University. Uh, Kartik has a PhD from Stanford University, and his research presents a unique perspective in that his work spans mechanical engineering and computer science. Uh, it's uh, situated in work in design and geometry. He, he uses machine learning, human-computer interaction, computational geometry, and search uh, shape representation in his work. In particular, I'm sure you'll be excited to see his work on helping ch children learn design by making robotic toys. Karthik? Okay, thank you very much. Circle team, Gautam, Jeremy, and everyone else. So, so I'm going to be talking about uh, several different things, and uh, in fact, a lot of connections to prior talk, you know, including Mary's, and, and uh, also going beyond prototypes, uh, and, and also creating very authentic uh, user experiences that uh, we can think about. But also, I want to open up um, thoughts uh, in, in all of you in terms of how um, the future of interaction of us with computing, or how computers are going to look, or where they're going to go, uh, and should we even think of computers as being computers uh, as we have thought of uh, them in the past. So, so in terms of uh, what I want to talk, and let me kind of begin. Um, you know, and and in terms of a lot of my interactions, I've uh, I think I did that uh, scavenger hunt. I came second, <laughs> I <thought> heard. <laughs> uh, that's right. And I missed two questions. The, the uh, MOOC, I was sitting uh, at lunch and uh, thinking about the MOOC. Uh, and the other one was uh, somebody who uh, acted or did a play in the, in the uh, last one year. Those, those were tough. <laughs> but uh, eventually, I got it done. I got to know a lot of you, um, so, so that was interesting. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, many of you are educators. I really don't have to talk about this, but um, in my interactions, including uh, with, with my previous cyber learning grant and Janet and all the comments that, um, that I've got for work in the past, we all know that engagement uh, perhaps uh, is, is a substantial and uh, very critical problem. And if you break that, uh, we can get other channels of the mind open to learning. And, and uh, sort of in that sense, you know, getting them to play with stuff uh, but, but also all the kinds of things you have heard, the productive failure idea, and, and uh, sort of uh, in some ways um, doing that. And robotics seems like a very nice way to get them to do stuff. But if you look at uh, educational robotic kits in the past, they are too simplic simplistic or too complex. And uh, also, um, you know, they kind of promote set ways of doing things. It's not open-ended, but still it's not closed-ended. So you sort of need to, need to um, think about it um, in, in an in-between way. And so we kind of got, uh, got to think about it. But also when I um, joined Stanford, one of the first people that I ran into was Doug Engelbart. Um, those of you, I mean, you, all of you know the mouse and, and, uh, and so on, the WIMP interfaces, windows, icons, menus, pointers. And, and these are, these the, the serve, they still serve us extremely well uh, and, and the design tools. But, um, but also, you know, computing is changing phase. So, so we kind of got onto this, this idea of, of uh, uh, thinking about robotics differently. So kind of let me start off with this. That's me. That's Spencer. This is our office. The Zero UI team gave us a few robotics kits to mess around with. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted a simpler, more natural interface with my creations. These are the guys from Zero UI. Their dream is to make robotics easy and fun for everyone. Their team created the Zyro, the world's first hand gesture controlled robotics kit for everyone. Zyro consists of three parts, the motorized modules, the smart glove, and the smartphone app. Zyro's modular design enables freeform robotics construction, enabling you to build virtually anything. Modules can be animated in a hinge or 360 degree rotational movement. Pair your glove to the modules with the smartphone app and bring your robot to life.
Whether you're a robotics enthusiast, an aspiring superhero, evil genius in training, or someone looking to expand their creativity, Zyro is for you. Zyro is for all ages and all genders. There's no limitations. You can design and build it from scratch or use a pre-made starter kit. Design, build, rebuild. Zyro can be used over and over again, making new and different robots each time with the same modules. Learning should be fun and engaging. Unleash your creativity and be at the forefront of robotic technology with Zyro. Zyro, let your imagination come to life. Okay, so yeah, maybe this was a rejected proposal in cyber learning, I don't know, but <laughs> um, you know, we just didn't have time to wait, um, so we kind of um, put a team together and, and uh, got it out to the real world, and we wanted to use the real world as a playing field so we get authentic feedback and, and uh, our research can proceed uh, very rapidly. So, um, in fact, the startup that came out of it, most of the actors you saw were my students, um, mostly ma all master's students, and they were kind of just, best way to do tech transfer was to move them off to the startup, and um, they were the actors there as well. Um, but, but also I've been very influenced by the idea of making uh, computing and computers and learning sort of become a part of our way of doing things and building things and making things. And um, you know, I, like Mark Weiser's code, 1991, um, exactly the same year I joined Purdue 25 years ago. Um, so um, very influenced by the time then. And, and then we have been playing around uh, with, with this um, uh, platform, uh, doing workshops wherever we can. And, and this is a, a charter school um, out in Indy. And, and this is a very, this is a real photograph. You know, once they get engaged uh, in this kind of um, um, wanting, to, wanting to play, they become curious, and, and, and then you, you're, you're on to the next step. But I kind of want to rewind a little bit into, um, you know, how we got into these kinds of things. Um, and roughly about 20, 21 years ago, uh, when I was at Purdue, we started looking at um, how we can give authentic design experiences, building experiences to undergrad students. And we started, uh, 3D printers were just coming out in 92, 93. We got a couple of them. They're still good, better than many of the newer ones uh, these days. Uh, and, and we started playing around with these. So I, I've been teaching a toy design class at Purdue for almost 20 years plus. And that was my playing field of trying things out. Um, and. Um, and I didn't know of this community until eight years ago, and I said, oh, wow, you know, I can get funded for things I'm already doing, and, and uh, started getting into it more deeply. So we have play workshops, uh, understanding play. Uh, they open up existing toys, do a lot of things in, the, in workshops. Uh, most of the workshop, all the workshops are with pen and paper, uh, but in Paddle, they have the labs where they are actually learning the computer tools and um, how 3D printing can be used better, um, but also, um, many of the parts are machine parts and so on. So the toys have gotten pretty complex these days. So it was kind of like a makerspace, like right from the early 90s. Uh, the university has actually built a museum. So if you visit, um, you'll see um, hundreds and hundreds of toys there. So today's uh, rest of my talk here is sort of going to be just for you to think about how Windows and mouse change the way we learn today. Think about that, right? So. A question to all of you is, how do you think it's going to change beyond the iPhones and touch? Well, <laughs> I don't have answers, but um, you know, we are trying a lot of things here, and have been. And you sort of see the Zyro modules and things going on, and the glove here. Um, I can tell you the next generation glove is just going to be a tattoo. It's already in the making in our labs. Um, we have had some serious uh, work going on. Between, between material science and, and uh, machine learning, uh, and, and that law is going to not have electronics inside the material. It's, it's, going, it's, it's going to be very different. I can tell you that. You'll see that later. Um, could be um, as early as uh, another year or so. But also, I want you to think about you know, user interfaces and the so-called natural user interfaces. And uh, I would also ask you to think about the natural user and interfaces, not natural user interfaces, so the two are somewhat different, okay? So, so computers as a partner is sort of like the driving philosophy has been uh, in, in, our, in our labs for, for quite a while, and, and this notion of interdisciplinarity is sort of 
it's there. So you'll see Matt CS people, EC people, you'll see um, Maker folks, um, Dio and, and Terrell, for example. Um, and Dio was involved in the later stages of, of Zyro in, in terms of uh, getting stuff out of our lab into the real world. And, and so we kind of um, encourage those things, but also from the point of view of variables and so on. Just, just to sort of remind you, you know, in terms of uh, what has happened so quickly. 1972, right? The size of a Volkswagen is, is now um, in, in size the Apple iPod. So that's why variables are happening, right? So that's why we can do so much more. Uh, but in all this, the big problem is not computing or computers, but how to design algorithms and software deeply to work around humans. But I can also tell you this, in my experiences in the last 15 years, I was a computational geometer. It's not taking computational geometry and transforming it into learning experiences. What I've learned is almost every piece in geometric computation almost has to be thought upside down if you start putting it around humans. And I'll show you a couple of examples there. Uh, so the friction, right, in, tr in terms of computing, and this friction is not one thing, it's many things, and it's workflows and complex uh, problems that have to be solved. Good example is Amazon Go, right? It just didn't happen. A lot of work behind it. Uh, think of similar things for learning experiences that you can just take things out and, and, and um, be able to use the technology more easily. But also think about what we interact with computers with, hands, eyes, ears, nose, hands. Um, Jeremy talked about it. And Eileen talked about, I mean, and Mary talked about uh, um, the cognitive load part. I'm going to come to that uh, as well. Um, and, and so in spite of all this power, um, we have now to think upside down, literally, in terms of building computing around humans changes the way you think about computing. And there's a lot of science there that has to be figured out along with engineering and design and um, learning science uh, going in between all of them. And, and, and this idea of accessibility is not simple. And, and this friction is not a simple thing like two gears and something there, but just a characterization of what it can be. Um, just to come back and rewind to um, where we started uh, with, with this uh, modular robotics uh, kit. Um, basically, it, it's a new genre of robotics, even for commercial robotics. They don't talk like this. And uh, for us, this is a great playing ground to develop technology and, and um, kids are sharks, real ones, okay? <laughs> I, I thought they were more like, our, our judges were very nice. Um, so, um, but you know, the idea of crafting uh, design freedom and trying to be highly expressive and also working uh, with one of my colleagues, uh, Kylie Pepler in the Cy Cyber Learning Grant, um, we kind of uh, did a lot of testing with, with, um, with this technology and, and uh, explored um, uh, how kids interact with it. Uh, but also I want to tell you, like, we didn't originally start with the idea of, of uh, wanting to commercialize this technology. Um, we saw people, you know, we saw all these children playing with, with, with this lab construct that um, actually evolved. If you really want to know the story, you can visit our labs. But uh, these, these were, like, the solid things were, like, free from primitives that they were manipulating and changing and iterating, and, and it sort of uh, got them got them very engaged. And, and one of the reasons um, that these things happen was, um, for instance, this kid that uh, wanted to build a drumming robot was a drummer, and um, he wouldn't leave our labs without making it work. And he was doing all kinds of engineering, design, and, and stuff that you know, undergrads I've seen in, in, in one senior year um, perhaps may not you know, be as engaged because those problems are all all more canned problems, um, and, and only in senior design they get exposed to um, more open-ended constructs. So the point here is like getting them into something that they want to make, they want to build, and that allowing for it not working immediately. They have to do a lot of iteration before it starts working. Um, and, and including here, you know, this, this kid actually invented a new kind of a mechanism where by turning the hands, he could turn the vehicle very um, quickly. Uh, which you can't do with conventional steering mechanisms and so on. Um, so let me kind of move on here. Uh, well, it's good to get on um, just three years from concept to, to reality. Um, you know, so now we can do all the proposals and papers, and, um, and, and, and I want all of you to start doing research with, uh, with this kind of uh, platform. Uh, and and uh, so moving uh, on, also NSF uh, has, has, has supported a lot of our work. This is a 
more recent project uh, we, we got funded. It's sort of like a platform for making um, and, and uh, being more on demand um, and, and also playing around with, uh, with new types of interfaces, including uh, sketch and touch, we'll talk about it, uh, Google Tango-like settings and so on, trying to um, encourage, uh, encourage more personalized uh, construction. And here's uh, one of our recent Kai papers. <laughs> So the idea here was, um, you know, in the early early one, r robotics being complex and simple, but making it more accessible was was our driving uh, motivation. But then, once you get in, uh, as I said, you can get in other forms of learning. But uh, more so here, the design of the robot itself uh, is a challenge, right? And and the so-called CAD tools are called computer-aided design tools. It's kind of the opposite thing here. It's it should be design-aided by computers, right? So again, an opposite way of thinking about it. Um, but here, you can just scan a uh, soft um, toy, and let's say you want to bring it to life. Um, it's, it's, we, we, we made this tool, which is very easy and simple, has very few functionalities, uh, but it creates a, creates a process plan, um, allows uh, for somebody without uh, knowledge of any of these computer tools to start uh, putting animation into it. And uh, most of all, whatever comes out is manufacturable. It will not have self-intersections and so on and so forth. So a lot of uh, concurrent processing on the back is happening um, in it. Uh, but also you can use a $200 cutter to cut cardboard and, and make stuff out of it. So we are big into cardboard. And um, you know it, it gives people more quicker feedback than uh, 3D printers and so on, which you have to wait for, for uh, quite a bit. And, uh, uh, and, and also, um, now, of course, less as a, if you make the connections, these can then be animated uh, and, and, and becomes a good, good material to start with. Uh, cardboard is also very um, open-ended. You know, it allows for you to do a lot of things with it uh, fairly quickly and iterate. There's a dyno. Um, but like I said, in the back end, there's a lot of geometric algorithms that, that run, not really like the way in which you think about computational geometry, but they are very different. And it reasons out uh, in, in real time, as you have seen that software tool doing things, and, and figures out how to do it. Um, uh, but also because of uh, some of our work, we have gotten, well, the startup has, uh, I should say that I have a conflict of interest. Um, I was the co-founder of Zero UI. Um, so Zero is no. UI is no user interface. The idea is like the user interface uh, disappears into you. Uh, and, and so they have been working with, with um, things like Blockly, and that's the creator of Blockly up there, and, and uh, have been working with um, AR, VR people. Uh, and much of the AR, VR companies like Meta came to our labs in, in, in very um, early, early times. So we've been exposed to, because of our, our uh, cutting edge research, we have been exposed to these technologies way, way ahead of time. And, and also now it gets into hopefully schools. Uh, so I'm going to kind of jump a little bit here into um, um, this one kind of came off CD the cyber learning grant. And, and uh, the idea here is to use touch and pen to create. In the cyber learning grant, mostly we were working in, in 2D uh, collaborative scenarios, but uh, we really wanted to make sketching in 3D uh, possible and as simple as sketching on paper. We are very close to it, I'll tell you. Uh, but um, I think this tool is going to be um, used widely in the future, or at least tools like this are going to be widely used in the future. Very easy to create in 3D. Uh, and uh, also it's collaborative. I'll kind of get to the collaborative angle in a, in a, in a bit. Um, so, so the idea here, as you see, is very limited functionality. And uh, here uh, we have tested this out with, with uh, tons of people. Um, and and uh, so, so if you're creating a bike, uh, you can have different... Uh, members do different things, and they can collaboratively exchange through a uh, browser, but it also changes how the creation happens. Uh, you know, you're not going to go take paper and copy it and distribute it to others. So it changes the outcomes of, uh, of, 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 the, of the idea itself uh, because of this um, collaboration. And a little bit to talk to the cognitive load, this, this tool, um, it's, it's about 200,000 lines of code written by Two really good PhD students. One is in uh, A&M, and uh, another one has gone to work in in, in um, uh, does so. But basically, if you look at it, 
Um, it's it's uh, the, the, the cognitive load is so low that people can actually focus on the creation. And, and, uh, and then you're creating stuff very quickly. So this summer, we're going to put it to test in the uh, workshops that we run with children uh, from around the world. We do two workshops of 16 students each, and, and we're going to test it out to uh, perhaps make cardboard bikes uh, quickly, and, and uh, we, are, we are figuring that out. Um, so this is a collaborative ideator. It's a Kai paper coming up this year. Um, you know, so, our, so you, you can watch this in our lab website. Kind of moving on, um, we kind of are looking at how we can use our tacit human knowledge, like I don't need a manual to pick something up or turn something down, and there are a lot of tools I've used already um, that I know how to use, that's how we grow up. Right? So the idea is like, how can we use those uh, knowledge and bring it into the real world through computing? And, and uh, you kind of saw this bike uh, thing from sketch and touch. And creating that uh, uh, algorithms and software to support sketch and touch for creating those kinds of things was not an easy task. You know, I mean, I've, we really know this game uh, very, very, very well, um, and, and it's not it's not uh, science as usual. Building technology around humans is, is, is a very different thing. Um, and, and I've seen this NSF, that 10 things, you know, human-centered design. A little surprised that they didn't talk to um, learning scientists. So this is uh, using our embodied interaction. And again, we have a series of uh, things going on here. It's called mobile modeling, sort of using um, the way in which we um, can move and twist objects and do all those things to create in 3D. Now we are kind of building a bridge between this and um, AR kind of technologies, like the one that you saw earlier, uh, the HoloLens uh, and, and, uh, and so on. Today's newspaper actually had a very nice article. Well, uh, Zuckerberg is investing heavily into AR. You may want to look into it. Uh, but uh, in our lab, we sort of still think that these technologies are, are um, further away from prime time, uh, and, and uh, they're, going to, they're going to take their own time to really become useful uh, for, for people at large. OK, so quickly moving on. This is uh, for you to look into our lab's uh, uh, work going on. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work on making everyday objects interactive just by putting a magnet in the object. And, and then we can, uh, we can solve the, uh, I'm not going to get into math here, but basically solve the um, uh, uh, magnetometer, um, magnetic field equations real time between a new pen that we designed, which also sends a gesture around the pen. So essentially, the entire space around the phone becomes interactive. You can uh, assemble virtual Lego to physical Lego and so on and so forth. So we've been playing with such technologies. Uh, but also, we have been uh, invested very heavily into machine learning and deep learning in trying to bring our hands without any variables as a user interface. Um, we are perhaps among the best in this area right now. And uh, of course, um, Microsoft wants to grab all our students um, in this area. Um, a, a third uh, genre, I think, that kind of comes out of our work. I don't know if it's a genre or a platform, but let me use platform um, here. The idea is uh, how uh, we can create new things by creating new machines to create new things that will allow us to interact with uh, software and algorithms uh, in new ways. And, and this is just another example here, uh, converting a soft toy into um, 3D metal bent and also laser cut all put together with, with a bunch of connectors which allow uh, special types of kinematic motion. And by the way, you don't have to be an expert in any one of these. So both cardboardizer and this kind of genre, in these uh, cases, a lot of um, the, the balance between what the computer does and what the humans do has uh, we have shifted that line substantially so that humans can do things that will allow them to do it. Also changes the nature of people that will engage with software tools by uh, building such, such things. I'm going to move quickly. I'm not going to talk about it. But I see a huge, huge, we see in our lab a huge opportunity in bringing deep learning and HCI into, into um, uh, educational settings. And, um, and you can browse our work in this area. These technologies are not yet mature for cyber learning. But um, the students and uh, in, 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 uh, you know they all are mixed up, so they talk about these things um, in the same lab. And, and sort of moving further, uh, bringing all these things together. So the idea of creating, fabricating, going beyond DIY kind of stuff, um, and, and all that, uh, and then building, uh, and, and the idea of interacting with it, and, and then tinkering, you know, changing things, center of gravity, forces, dynamics of structures. Um, 
and materials, uh, you know, so all those iterations start happening. Uh, this was a very uh, early, early version of, of uh, the robot toy. Actually, that was sort of just starting when my cyber learning grant was starting. So uh, it has gone to the real world very, very fast. So I came to the very first cyber learning uh, conference here. So making design, I wrote it easy in the beginning. I edited it to easier. It's still, <laughs> still there, uh, ongoing, and fabrication accessible, and robotics intuitive. And, and uh, center of it all is, um, you know, our lab logo there is the hands, of, so hands. And this whole idea of, of uh, uh, this, this so-called sort, of, sort after productive state, uh, uh, productive failure, uh, when you're playing with things and, and sort of having coaches that help uh, children not get frustrated, but when they get frustrated enough, getting them on, either as a team or, or by scaffolding. Uh, all that uh, is at play here, and, and as uh, Janet, put it once to me, like sort of uh, tricking uh, uh, children into learning, but not in a bad way, in a good way. That's kind of like a metaphor that I've been using here uh, quite a bit. And, and uh, lowering the cognitive load, you've seen that. You also saw some, some level of computer-supported collaborative learning happening in, in Code3D uh, and, and uh, so, so we kind of want to very interesting things here. And of course, um, all of you know, uh, what I'm showing you here, but the idea of objects to think with uh, using artifacts and tools that um, extend your, your um, experience. So we had to go beyond, beyond you know, what, what you know, I'm looking in, at your audience to see who's going to be the next Seymour Papert. I think the time, time has come uh, for, for, for uh, this type of uh, uh, level of going back into, into uh, learning science, but in a very different way that we have done from in the past. And finally, wanting to end, um, I like this quote, uh, we shape our tools and our tool shapers and, and actually pointed out to the idea that even light you know, changed how we work, extended our daytime, I mean, working hours and so on. So kind of think about uh, computing in that way. But also from USA Today, came out today, um, Mark Zuckerberg's people aren't using uh, primitive tools because they prefer primitive tools, but they are using it because primitive tools are still um, not developed well. So finally, to summarize, there's a strong convergence of many areas, electronics, software, um, ability to make physical things, and, and bringing it all together in, in uh, very new ways. And, and also, um, learning, learning sciences with children grounds our work, um, creates authentic use cases that we um, really enjoy uh, working with, um, with people in, that, that add to our capabilities, especially um, as, as in, uh, involving learning in between. And also the idea of removing this friction between humans and machines um, involves fairly deep, uh, deep dive into, into the disciplinary areas, but also bringing them together through um, the so-called design thinking and making. I think all that uh, creates a very nice uh, setting for, for learning. And, and finally, like I think the future of cyber learning is now getting into our labs. You know, we have really looked at how human fatigue happens when you use this AR, VR settings. That's a big detriment uh, to, to moving these technologies. Uh, and also, how software design should happen for that. It's a Kai paper, so if you want to look at it. Um, wanted to acknowledge uh, all of our student teams. A couple of them are at MIT. Uh, a couple have gone to faculty positions, including Vinayak, who helped uh, quite a bit in the mobile modeling and uh, co 3 d at Texas A&M. And, um, Dio's here, uh, several others that have graduated um, are, are um, doing pretty well. So I want to end at that, uh, thanking the Circle team again. By the way, uh, Cinevo made this Iron Man suit completely by hand, sketching, bending metal, cutting sheet metal, no computers, no machines, OK? It's a crazy guy. He, he worked on this for almost half the summer. And he showed me his portfolio. I just ignored the rest of it. He showed me this. I, you know, immediately offered him a position in our lab. He's just an <laughs> a undergrad, um, just uh, passed his second year. And he's surprised why he's in our lab, but uh, I think now he knows. Uh, so acknowledging NSF and um, the multiple NSF grants that we got, including um, uh, SGTR and so on. So I don't have an answer. Um, I think the um, HoloLens and Oculus I uh, have to go, and there's a company called Magic Leap, which has hired, again, one of my students. Uh, and and uh, so we'll see how this changes learning and how learning changes our uh, ability to think about new uh, interfaces and interactions. Thank you.